So, who read my newsletter this week? <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, hey, so many more of you. For those of you who read it this week, it must have been like deja vu. <laughs> I've seen it the week before, the six of you who had seen it the week before. Although, what I liked, when I sent it out this week, I got some comments from people at Unity of New York who said, I read it last week, Sean, and I read it again this week. <laughs> more than what raised their hands here last week. And so, I'm not here to shame anybody, I'm just here to say, people pay attention, because you never know in that newsletter, it was Kenneth years ago, so why don't you write a letter for the newsletter? Rather than just sending out information about us, he said, why don't you write a message every week? And so I do. One person thought I took the weekly letters out of old, an old stockpile of, that I had somewhere of letters when I came to work here. It's like, no, they're fresh. Fresh off the griddle every week. And, and so, too, some are longer, some are, some are shorter. This week, to continue on our theme of the metanoia, for those of you who uh, don't remember what I said metanoia is, what metanoia was Jesus' message. It's how he spoke, which meant change of heart, change of mind. That's what metanoia meant. If I keep talking about it, it will become metanoying. <laughs> and that's when you'll know you really need to listen. <laughs> but the, in the in the metanoia, to to uh, G Jesus' uh, first message was repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, what does repent mean? Except change your mind, change what you think about God, change what you think about this earth, and this earth includes your body. Change what you think about love. And that's what I'm going to talk about today is changing what we think about love. Because too many of us, I love this one, but I don't love this one, and I love this one, and I don't love this one, and I love this one, and I don't love this one. I'll forgive this one, but not this one, and I'll forgive this one, but not this one. And if everybody would just agree with me, I could love you all. And and it's it's horrible. It's horrible what we're doing. The, the ultimate foundation point of Christianity was to take away hell, sin, and guilt from our consciousness. And we seem to keep trying to give it to ourselves just because our parents gave it to us. We keep receiving it. They haven't spoken to us in years, many of us, about this, but we're still, we, we've maintained the family tradition, <laughs> as it were. And we don't have to anymore. That's the good news. That is truly the very good news. I no longer have to try to motivate myself through guilt or fear. And, and I, uh, no matter how many times I preach this, I still hear people doing it. I have a guy I'm working with right now, and I keep saying, you do not have to figure this out. And I told you this two weeks ago about this guy. You don't have to figure this out. And last night we're, we're out and he says, well, I just had to figure out this. I said, cut it out. It's already figured out. You and I are not going to figure God out. What we're going to do is put down our definitions of God and it will reveal itself to us. Every day, whatever God is, is revealing itself to us. And we say, that can't be it. That can't be it. More people would agree with my misery if... If, if God, this were God. And we don't want God to agree with our misery. Something I, I in my studying this week that came up for me, I love this, I just love this. The Bible was written from certain people's perspective of God that doesn't make it God. It doesn't make it the word of God. It just comes from their understanding, and that's what I do on Sundays. That's what Teresa does when she speaks. That's what David does. That's what so many of us do. We speak from our own understanding of God, but it's not God. And so to get that, as you study, you're going to develop your own understanding of it. But what I beg of all of us is to put down our previous understanding of God when we pick up the new study. When we look into the new way of looking at it, put down the previous one. Don't put new wine into old wineskins, as the lesson tells us in the Bible. Quit trying to make 
the new understanding that Sean's talking about or this one's talking about or that one's talking about fit into our old limited belief. Get a new wineskin. Meaning a new understanding, a new willingness to say, oh. See, that's how unity played its part with me. When I started studying unity, I thought, oh my gosh, of course that has to be it. I was so willing to put down old limited beliefs. I was, what, because I had had enough of the old way. As Well, I thought I did, you know, I still grab onto an old way sometimes. But I realized, when I, these unity teachings, I studied every single unity foundation book. Started with Myrtle Fillmore's How to Let God Help You. And then I, I then Emily Cady's Lessons in Truth. And then there was a lot of others. And I got through all of the Charles Fillmore to the point where I could teach a Charles Fillmore book and know what I'm talking about and be pretty clear on what he was talking about. At the beginning, I had no idea what those books were saying. And, and the, because they were so disjointed. And I found out later why they were. It's because they're, most of those books he didn't sit down and write. They're taken from lectures oh. of his that people recorded and then <laughs> wrote out. The problem, some of you who have read Charles Fillmore will say, there are three ways to do this. One, da 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 da. Two, da 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 da. Three. <laughs> and there is no three. <laughs> it's maddening. And they used to criticize Charles for that. It's just that sometimes when you're talking, you forget about three. <laughs> you never make it to the third example. And if you're open, it doesn't matter because Charles wasn't coming down from the mount. Charles was stating his understanding with the divine hope that everyone who was listening would then go within and get their understanding if their understanding let them be free in their thinking, let them be free from the bondage of self, the old bondage ways of, or I should say limited ways, which is the same thing as bondage really, and to look at it in a whole new light. Say, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, listen to this. Uh, funny, Unity, Charles Fillmore didn't want a church. He did not set out to have a church. He set out to have, he and Myrtle Fillmore, his wife, who was really the heart of Unity and the, the pioneering member of Unity was Myrtle. And we'll tell that story some other time. But it started out as a prayer group around a kitchen table. And then it became a publication called Thought, Thought Magazine, back in 1889. That's the official beginning of Unity. 1886 is what I consider because that's when Myrtle Fillmore had her healing of tuberculosis. But it took three more years of praying together. And that prayer group from the kitchen table became the Society of Silent Unity, which today is Silent Unity, the oldest existing telephone prayer line in the world. Okay, so any of you didn't know, you can call this number. It's in your bulletin here it's on our website and call this number anytime day or night and someone will answer the phone hello this is silent unity how may i pray with you they won't counsel you they won't have an opinion hopefully <clears throat> i've heard about one opinion that we're not even going to go into right now but it's like appalling wow. that somebody would say hey the, i'll tell you yeah. okay <laughs> uh, a woman in new york called and her dog had just peed all over her bed. And she was just so upset. And, and she, uh, she called and said, I'm so upset. My dog just peed on my bed and I just want to kill her. And the woman said, well, I don't know if I can pray with you because I love animals. And it's like, oh, no. Oh, no, you misunderstand. <laughs> you misunderstand the point of this call. Uh, <laughs> and so one of, my, one of my favorites is um, a minister I used to have. He, when he was in ministerial school, he worked at Silent Unity. And sometimes you have Freudian slips, and sometimes you... One of, one of my favorites is, we know that all was blessed and we see your hole. <laughs> <laughs> you can laugh, Jen. It's funny. <laughs> That's some funny stuff. I didn't make that up. <laughs> that, and remember, this is back in the 70s. He, or maybe, eight, no, 80s. 
And he, 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 a man called, and he was so upset because he realized he was realizing he was gay, and he didn't know what to do about it. And at the end of the phone call, this person, the the, the my friend, my minister who was praying, said, "We see everything well, and the way is made queer." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. It happens. <laughs> <laughs> we can laugh about these things. And that's the important thing is we can laugh about these things. No one was harmed in the making of this talk. <laughs> no one was harmed. Can we all say that, though? I don't, I'm not asking you to repeat that. Oh. What I'm saying is, can we all say that about the way we live our days? No one was harmed in the way I ha thought my thoughts today. Directly or indirectly, no one was harmed by the words I spoke today. Now, I'm not saying we always have to say peace and quiet words. We can have direct confrontations as long as they, the intention is love. We never know how people need to hear things. So you've got to pay attention to that. And sometimes you, you just got to blast somebody. That's the only way to get through. And other times you have to be very gentle and very compassionate and soft. Not everybody can take a harsh critic. And some people just need to be seen. I was talking with a, a friend of mine yesterday who's really struggling. And I said, look, I see your pain. I hear it loud and clear. And he started to cry. And I said, what's up? And he said, no one's ever said that to me before. No one's ever told me they've seen my pain. I said, well, it's all over the place. I don't know how they missed it unless they're just not interested. I said, I have no judgments on it. It doesn't scare me. And so you're safe, at least with me, to have the, have to experience this pain till you can transform it, metanoia it, into a change of heart and a way to be of service. We can all use our past to serve another. As I love the AA promise. No matter how, we will not regret the past. No matter how far down the line we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. And that's why there's no cause for regrets. So, where's my stuff? I want to read this. This entire book. <laughs> <laughs> you don't mind, do you? You have time. <laughs> Good. We don't. <laughs> okay, just one little part of this page. This comes from a book I've been reading called The Great Meaning of Metanoia. <clears throat> and uh, he's, what he's talking about is metanoia in this chapter, chapter 5. The method of Christ's teaching. Now, he refers to Jesus as Christ. I don't do that. I don't teach to do that. But I get it. And it says, we are now fairly brought to the moment when Jesus himself began to proclaim and to say... The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Take upon you a new mind, and believe the glad tidings. And it goes on to say, God is now to reign on earth. Heaven is all about you. Sin, sorrow, death are no more. Peace, joy, eternal life are yours. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Awake, awake, all is changed. Change ye. Believe not the world, believe me. I bring you good tidings of great joy. I was so pleased to read that this week. Uh, awake, wake, all is changed, all is changed. So change ye. If there is no more hell, if there is no more sin, if there is no more death as a reality, then change your mind about these things. Quit proclaiming them for yourself. Believe not the world. Believe me, meaning the Christ mind. Believe the light. I bring you good tidings of great joy. Oh, and then, oh, this other one, just one line on the next page. It says, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So you that has ears to hear what I've just taught here, may you hear what I just said. And may you live in it. 
what I just said. May you live in this joy that is promised. May you live in this freedom that is promised. This happiness, may you choose for happiness. You can't choose happiness while you're choosing misery. And so I invite you to meticulously look at every aspect of your thoughts, your words, and your actions to see, am I spreading love and joy to my brothers and sisters? Or am I spreading limited thinking and bargaining? Am I sending all of us to hell that doesn't even exist anymore with my thoughts, with my words and my action? Am I condemning all of humanity by criticizing part or by condemning part of human, not criticizing, condemning part of humanity? See, since we're not separate, if I condemn a part, I condemn all of it. Is that what I'm doing? Because if that's the case, then I'm first in line to hell. I'm leading the way to a hell consciousness, or can I lead the way, would I lead the way, to a heaven consciousness? I believed my teachers when they said we could all have health all of the time. I believed them. It made sense to me. Because if some are having healings, it has to be that all can have a healing. If they choose, and one might say, well, they didn't choose. I met, How many of you saw our Facebook postings this week? Our friend Peter Sade made his transition. He played the sheriff in Desperate Measures. He's 36 years old. One of the kindest, most lively people. We loved him. We trusted him. He was generous. He was talented. He was sexy. He was happy. And he had a pulmonary embolism. He had a couple of back surgeries. The uh, bone was growing into his spine, correct? And he had those, but somebody wrote Monday, they were with him. He was walking with a cane Tuesday. The embolism happened and he left. I don't know what that means and I don't know. I can't pretend to, I can't make it up. What I can do is cry, but I will not do is say it shouldn't have happened. I can say I wish it hadn't. But I can't live my life with regrets that life is somehow bad because Pete left. What I can be grateful for is I love Pete. That Pete affected my life. And Peter said affected just about everyone in this church. You know, through, if you didn't see the show, you were affected when he sang here. I put two songs he sang here. You were affected through his relationship with David. So you see... Pete, and if you go to his page, my gosh, the world is responding on his page. And, it, and it's like, oh, this man was loved. He spread love around. And so how can I say God is absent here? Well, I don't even say life is absent here. Life just transformed from here to here. I can't explain it. What I can tell you is, I wasn't looking up the obituaries of people I don't know this week to mourn over them. I chose to mourn my friend Pete. And so it would be arrogant of me to say it shouldn't have been Pete. Complete arrogance when I don't care about all the others who left. My friend Leo's dog made her transition this week. And he's having great sadness over it, but he's not hurting himself in any way, I'm happy to say. He, uh, he loved this dog for 12 years, which I guess is old for a French, French uh, boxer, French whatever, bulldog. French bulldog. And so he can be grateful for that and feel his sadness that she's not there at night when he comes in. And so you look at those things and you say, oh, oh, I don't know, but how can I love during this? How we love the most important thing how we love ourselves, how we love each other. Sometimes we have to remind each other where we're coming up short. Sometimes we don't want to be reminded and we will punish those who remind us. How, here's the good, good news. You don't have to be punished just because somebody tries. Just because somebody tries to say, I'll show you, you say, I will not be shown. I will love you instead. I will love you instead. You will not show me your misery and, and send me to hell. 
If you want to show me your pain and say, how do I get through this? If you want to talk to me and if you think I can help you, great. But you will not punish me. Or at the very least, I will not be punished today. Just because somebody forgot their God's beloved child called beautiful. I don't care to forget today that I am God's beloved child. And I'm going to do my best to remember you are too. Because if I forget that you are, then I've forgotten that I am. To pay attention to this stuff. So, I found this, and I like it. Where is it. Okay. Seven things you need to know if you're experiencing metanoia. A change of mind, heart, self, or way of life. By Brianna Wiest. One, if it's a relationship that prompted a revolution in your worldview, know that the relationship has likely served its purpose. A lot of people hold on to the catalyst of their personal awakenings because they confuse big love for being forever love. They're not the same thing. Two, you don't need to be mad about your limiting old beliefs. Changes in building what's next, not in dismantling what was. You don't need to ruminate in disappointment for how long you spent not realizing there was more to life than you had assumed. The point is that you figured it out eventually. Three, the base of any personal catastrophe or desire for deeper understanding is usually the same. It's the realization that you and only you are responsible for your life. You cannot depend on anything, anything, to do the real grueling work of what it means to find comfort in a world that's entirely impermanent. No job, no amount of money, no relationship, no accomplishment can supplement that for you. It's a peace you must come to first. Then you can enjoy the rest. Loving yourself is an action, not a feeling. When we think of romantic love, we think of the flush of hormones that give us an ooey-gooey emotion. We rarely think... Let's just leave it at that. We, we rarely think... <laughs> We rarely think of the daily tasks and commitments necessary to make someone else's well-being as important as our own. The same goes for loving yourself. We think it's the emotion that comes with holding yourself in a high regard, when most of the time, it's more like standing up for yourself, having the courage to keep going, having the courage to quit, finding happiness despite the impermanence and unreliability of things, and so on. Number five, you don't need to have every answer, nor will you ever have every answer. It's never, I'm sure she wrote it in that tone of voice, by the way. It's <laughs> never about how certain you are. It's about how willing you are to try anyway. Nobody knows the mysterious abyss from which we come and eventually go back to. And yet so many people's lives and our society, culture in general, are crafted and dictated from teachings about this unknown. Everything is speculation for now, but some speculations lead to a happier, kinder, more peaceful world, and some don't. The point isn't who knows what's for sure, but point is who is willing to know to do what it takes to make the best version of the reality we have now. You don't need to believe in anything, but you do need to be able to listen to what feels true in the moment and hold enough objectivity to speak and act with respect and kindness toward yourself and those around you. And if you're instructed or pressured to believe in anything that doesn't resonate with you at basically every cell of your being, know that it is your internal guidance system saying, not quite. Finally, your struggles will be what you make, this is hard, your struggles will be what you make you what, your struggles, I had to read it four times to myself to get the, 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 your struggles will be what you make you what you are. What? Oh, yeah, I know. You'll have to read that yourself. Discomfort is the pressure. <laughs> pressure. Discomfort is the, they need, the, I wish they would. I need to typo. You make yourself what you are. Listen to the man over here. Discomfort is the pressure usually required to make us act in a way that we wouldn't otherwise. This on the surface feels scary because it is unknown. 
But the most difficult moments of your life will be the catalysts of your becoming. The challenges will grow you into someone you never imagined that you could be. The bad things in your life will be the necessary leeways into things better than you can imagine. You will be grateful things didn't turn out the way you wanted. You will be grateful for what you struggle with once you get to the other side. You know, I didn't want to quit smoking. Oh, it was uncomfortable, but I'm so glad I did. I'm so relieved that I did. I'm so relieved that I don't dare have a puff because I have a feeling I wouldn't be so grateful that I had stopped anymore <laughs> and I, I would start again. So this last thing, in the Holy Spirit's interpretation of the New Testament, and it says, your thoughts may seem to trick you as many of them support the busy idleness of the mind. Therefore, manage your thoughts in this way. As a thought comes up in your attempts to rest, look at it gently. With no attachment to what it says, ask only this question, have you come to me from the heart? Do you hear that? Yeah. Ask your thoughts, have you come to me from the heart? You will feel the answer immediately. Do not doubt what you feel. It is the heart that answers this question in judgment. When the answer is no, ask the thought to pass by in peace. Feel no resistance to that which you've asked to fade away. When the heart answers yes, relax into listening. Relax fully as you need not question this thought anymore. Let your questioning turn to trust. Let listening be the practice of the quiet mind. You are listening to your true voice and it is teaching you who you truly are. Today's talk is called How We Love. The most important thing. Love isn't something temporary. Love is. It's in us, around us. It just is. Love is the path. Love is the circle. Love is 